Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, and welcome to the Stein Seedcast. I'm your host, David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company. We've got another great episode lined up with special guests, expert insights, and discussion on everything you need to know about maximizing yield potential. On today's episode, our special guest is Ken Wolf, Director of Training for Stein Seed Company. Welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you, David. I'm glad to be here. As the Director of Training, Ken leads new sales team members through the ins and outs of our company policies, programs, and our high-yielding product lineup. Simply put, he provides our trainees with the information they need for success in the field. Ken has spent most of his career in the seed business, and his experience with Stein is far-reaching, having served in the sales organization in a number of roles. On today's episode, Ken is going to share his Stein story, including how he started, where he is today, and the most memorable moments from his tenure with the company. So let's get started. Well, Ken, just to get things started, we always like to have a level set. You know, I thought for starters, let's talk a little bit about where you're from. You know, you're, you're living in Iowa now, but you're not originally from Iowa. So tell us about your background. Well, I'm not originally from Iowa, but I uh, was born and raised as a child in the state of Ohio. A lot of people don't know that. And then as soon as I got into the sea business, I moved to the state of Indiana, and I've lived there for about 34 years. And about five and a half years ago, I was coming out here every other week, and I talked to my wife, and I said, hey, you know, we really would like to not have that commute. It was uh, 500 miles each way. And I said, would you consider moving to Iowa because I was coming out here every other week and it just made more sense. I could get more done. I just want you to know that, you know, my background is not in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Uh, My background actually comes from my dad worked for 40 years for Goodyear Tire Company. He was an executive for them. And so I was always wanting to be an executive for some company. That's kind of was one of my (laughs) desires. But when I was in junior high school, I took a job with a Hungarian truck farmer. If you know what truck gardens are, yep. we raised sweet corn, tomatoes, cucumbers, and so forth. And I worked for him for 50 cents an hour, okay? And, and he paid me well. We would work uh, six, seven hours a day and never worked on the weekends or anything like that. And I worked with him for about two years, and then he passed away. And his widow came to me and said, would you mind starting us out this year and getting everything ready to go? So actually, I started in February in their greenhouse, and we laid out seed in the flats and started selling transplants. And then by the time um, planting season came along, we had a two-row, a two-person mm-hmm. transplanter, right? And okay. so her son would drive the transplanter, and I would sit back there with two flats of plants, and then we would just, I became the two-man planter. I, <laughs> I did that all myself. I do have a degree in music. I mean, so that really qualifies me to be a, a, in agriculture. I have a degree in percussion performance from Wheaton College. And uh, it was during my junior, between my junior and my senior year, where I was able to get involved with agriculture, and specifically the seed industry. My brother's roommate in college, dad owns a seed farm in northern Indiana. Mm. And they were looking for some help to run the detasseling crews, okay? And so my brother said, hey, you used to work on a farm, you know, not knowing what (laughs) production agriculture was like. He said, would you be interested in coming out and helping them run these things called detasslers? And I said, yeah. So Uh, It was spring break, and so I was going from Wheaton, Illinois, back to Akron, Ohio, and so I stopped and met the farm family that was raising seed corn and stuff, and I said, what is detasseling? And they explained to me what was going to be involved, and they said their son is going to be moving to California, and we're looking for somebody to come in and, and basically run the detasseling for this summer. And so I took it upon myself to accept the position right then and there. And they took it upon themselves to find me a room in a house with, with another gentleman. And so I, uh, as soon as school was out that year, I moved to Goshen, Indiana, hmm. and went to work uh, on a seed farm, working roguing uh, and then detasseling. And so they I, were doing seed corn. They were doing seed corn. So yep. we had 800 acres of seed corn. Okay. And so my job was to organize all the detasslers 
and then talk with the head of the farm and uh, the farm manager and find out what fields would need to be detasseled tomorrow and then the next day and so forth. And we would lay out a schedule and we go out and detassel. And we did that six days a week. And uh, they did take Sundays off, which was a good thing. And so that's how I got my start in the seed business. <laughs> well, being a music major, I learned quickly that I wasn't good enough to make a good living in the music business, okay? <laughs> I was a performance major, but I, I just knew that I wasn't gonna be able to cut that. And so as I was working there, I, another opportunity arose. I got married. My wife and I were, still had school to finish, and as we got done with the detasseling, the farm family says, we want you to stay. And, and come to work for us full time. And I said, look, my wife has three months of school. I have six months of school. Let us go back and finish our degrees. So at least we have our degrees. And then I'll come back and work for you in March. And so they said, that'd be fine. And so that's what we did. We went back to Wheaton. We finished our degrees. And then my last two weeks of school were kind of different in the fact that I had my senior recital as a music performance major. I had my finals for my classes I was involved in. I had a baby, and then we moved. That was my last two weeks of school out there. So needless to say, we were kind of busy, and, and going back to the farm was a, a different life. Well, I'm fascinated that uh, uh, detasseling was your first job in production agriculture, and you decided to stay in production agriculture. Yes. At that time, I, I did not know anything else was available out there, okay? So, you know, I, I took the job out of necessity, but I really enjoyed what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned earlier, so you're a music major. Correct. And one of the great things about our organization is I think we have people from a wide variety of diversified backgrounds. Is there anything from your training in the music course of training that you brought to agriculture? Yes, I think the fact that I was a performance major gave me a good presence on a stage. And uh, for whatever reason, I was never afraid to talk from a stage. And it also led me to want to help more. So w when I get up on a stage now, I really don't get stage fright. And as, that's probably something that's br been brought into the business with, from a sales standpoint, and then also as a teaching standpoint, that the fact that I, I think I have pretty good stage presence, that uh, I'm very comfortable in that role, okay? And so that's one thing that really came forward. Plus the fact that it's almost like I look at every training class that I do as a performance. And I want to succeed. And I want people to appreciate that what I do, just like a musician would, okay? Musicians, they get a lot of applause. I get a lot of smiles. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of what I look for, okay? So in your performance major, all the world's a stage, I suppose. That's correct, <laughs> yes, as, as we'll find out later. <laughs> Okay, so that gives you, yeah, that was kind of your inroads into the seed business, right? And right. so you spent a few years in the seed business, and then at a certain point, you became at least aware of the work that Harry Stein was doing and Stein Seed Company. And that talk a little bit about maybe that first kind of awareness and, and what eventually led you to become involved with Stein Seed. Well, in 1983 is the first year I actually was recruited out of the production business and into the sales business, okay? Yeah. And I went to work for a small company by the name of Agapro. They were fairly large, but uh, I, I became a district manager for the state of Michigan at that time. And I spent three years with them. And then a company down in Woodburn, Indiana, uh, was by the name of Mommy Valley Seeds. And they were looking for a sales manager because they were getting ready to kick off corn sales for the first time. They had been a soybean company. And back in those days, we sold both public and private variety soybeans. Hmm. And so you dealt with things like corsoys and centuries and yeah. things like that. But then we also had a couple lines. They had a couple lines called Shawnees and Washington Fives and so forth. And they, re they recruited me to come down and be the sales manager and help kick off corn sales, all right? But then I got involved with the soybean side of it as well, and I said, what is Shawnee and what is Washington 5? And they said, well, we, these are private variety soybeans that we buy from an individual by the name of Harry Stein out in Adele, Iowa. 
And I said, oh, okay, it would be nice to meet him sometime. And they said, in fact, most of all what we sell on the private variety side comes from Harry Stein. Now, we do buy a little Dairyland seed. You know, they, they were a small breeding company at one time and eventually became part of a Corteva, yeah. uh, okay? And But uh, that's the first time I ever heard of Harry Stein, to be mm. honest with you. And so we, we were doing fine. We were growing the business. We were selling seeds, corn, and soybeans. And then in 1987, we had a devastating fire at the, at the corporation there in Maumee Valley Seed. Maumee Valley Seed was owned by five farm families, okay? okay? And what happened was uh, we had a chemical fire in our warehouse in May of, uh, I think it was May 27th mm. of 1987, and we burnt to the ground. And when the EPA came out and said, what, what do you have going on here? We told them what we had stored for farm chemicals. Not only did we sell seed, but we were a distributor for AMSI and so forth. Okay. And we ended up with all kinds of chemicals. And when they found out we had seven, the, the, the insecticide oh, seven, sure. in the warehouse, they made us pull back. And they pulled all the fire departments away from it. And they let it burn for three days. Because they said with seven, when you burn seven, you get cyanide gas. And we don't want anybody exposed to oh, that. Oh, wow. And so uh, we let it burn to the ground. And then... Uh, the, Within the next six months, we got the site cleaned up, um, and the five farm families decided they were going to build a monument to themselves, and so they rebuilt, okay? <laughs> and they probably got themselves a little bit overextended, uh, and so they were looking at some financial issues, and they decided they probably needed another partner to come in. And being uh, one of the first customers that Harry had uh, in the private variety soybean business, they approached Terry and said, we were, are wondering if you'd be willing to come in and buy part of our business. Hmm. And that was in 1987, 1988. Harry took about a year to decide that he, that's something he wanted to do. And so uh, when he finally decided that that was what he wanted to do, he informed them, I'm willing to come in but I come in for 51% because I want to have controlling interest of the company. And just just as, as a kind of a point of process here or, or thinking about that timing, you know, Stein as a company, of course, was still very centralized in Iowa and kind of sort of contiguous states around Iowa, but really didn't have a presence of any major sort east of the Mississippi other than some of the work that had been done by like Chuck Hansen. Chuck Hansen. Starting to grow yes. that in the in the 80s, right? Correct. And uh, he started growing that in the 80s and uh, it was coming together well for him. At uh, that time. At that time. Yeah. And so we joined the the, the the cast of, of characters with Stein at the time. <laughs> that December, we went to the American Sea Trade Association meeting in Chicago, down at the Hyatt, down in Chicago. And Harry says, hey, I've got some companies that I own. I want to invite you all in for dinner uh, on the first night of the American Sea Trades. So we sat down with Harry, uh, all of us. And in the room, there's people like John Henschen, Woody Cheeseman, Pat Shields. I think Scheckinger's were there uh, and so forth. And so it was decided then and there that we were going to merge those eight companies under the Stein name. And again, as another point of order, you know, a lot of name dropping in that in that last couple of minutes that has a lot of relevance to our business. You mentioned Pat Shields. Pat, mm -hmm. you know, was a longtime uh, regional manager for us, kind of in and around the Omaha, Nebraska area. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, just passed away, you know, here last last year. And then uh, John Henschen, who right. had a long, long tenure with us, coming from CDEX, if I'm right, Correct. and then eventually playing a very pivotal role in our our corn program. So uh, again, a lot of, of people, a lot of pillar folks right there in that time that you were dealing with that uh, are some who are no longer with us, but obviously had a huge, huge part in, in the growth of our organization. So. Sure. Yep. That's correct. So we were all in the room and, and the decision was made to merge the companies. And then about three or four months later, as we were putting all that together, Harry made another purchase where he purchased King Agro, which was a company that was stationed out of Canada, but we bought the U.S. operation of that, and they sold a lot of corn. And with the purchase of that, we also inherited a, a young man by the name of Bob Hall. And Bob then eventually became the sales manager for the Stein Seed Company, okay? Also at that time, uh, Chuck Hansen uh, was the sales manager for Stein Seed before the merger, 
And Harry asked him to come back to Adele and move his family back to Adele and take over as the production manager for Stein Seed Company, okay? And so Chuck did, and uh, we picked up his salespeople at that time and so forth, and, and we had a pretty good relationship. So when, when the Stein Seed Company was formed, I became a regional manager for region number five, and at that time, we had five regions. And, and basically, I had Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, New York, and so forth, whatever business we could establish at that time. And what, about what year is this then? That would be 1990 to 91. Okay. So in 1990 to 91, the nine companies merged, and we formed the Stein Seed Company. So 91... Roughly, the uh, Stein, the merger happens. Stein now has a presence throughout most of the Midwest or most of the corn growing area uh, in the upper Midwest area. So you kind of got all these groups together and talk a little bit about that time frame because obviously mergers are difficult in and of their own right, but you bring all these teams together. And as you said, the, the groundwork had been laid. You know, Chuck had done a good job out east of, of establishing the Stein name, but obviously probably not to the extent where we were household name Correct. at that time. What happened in the, in the very first year we merged the companies, and I'm going to credit Harry for this because I, I think he had the insight as to know that that just like any other business, the key is customer relationships with the salespeople that, they're, that people are used to dealing with. So when we made the merger, the one thing Harry did not do is he did not let anybody go. He kept every salesman, every sales manager that was, you know, that he wanted to. And we basically merged the nine companies together with the ability for every salesman to continue to service their present customers. Hmm. So when uh, I, there's a philosophy out there that when you merge a company, you can change the company name or you can change the w way uh, the person is dealing with, okay? Usually if you change the company name but keep the person you're dealing with, you'll retain that business. And for some reason, Harry had that insight that that's what we, he needed to do. So that very first year when we merged the company, we had a 20% growth in business instead of losing any business. Hmm. Wow. So moving ahead, when mid-1990s, mid then you hmm. went on to other opportunities? Yeah, I had, I had an opportunity to, to look at corporate America, which was totally different than working <laughs> for a family company. I actually went to work for Cargill for 10 years, okay? okay? And I, I joined a company by the name of Cargill Seeds, and they were looking forward to where they were, and they were a fairly large seed company. They sold a million bags of corn domestically here in the United States. Plus, they were one of the largest corn breeding companies outside of the United States. Hmm. They had market presence in about every country. What they would do is they would introduce seed into a country, and they said, we can come in and help you grow your agricultural business by giving you better seed to plant. And then they would people would plant that seed, and then they, they said, well, look at all this grain. What are you going to do with all this grain? Let us feed it to pigs and chickens so we can feed your people more protein. Sure. And so when the, with that happening, they go, well, we need to put in a fertilizer plant. <laughs> we need to put in a chemistry plant. And so that's how they got into the sea business, and that's why they got into 162 different countries worldwide right. by doing that. Very, very good philosophy. But something was happening in the mid-'90s, and so they decided to sell the company the seed company. And of course, I was employed with the seed company. And so I'm looking down the road going, okay, as soon as it sells, I might not have a job again. All right. And so it took them five years almost to sell the seed company. And they ended up selling uh, the domestic division to Dow for considerably less than what they originally got for it, mm -hmm. okay? And so it was time to move on. I sat down with the interview committee uh, that was interviewing for, to see if I could keep my job. And I sat down and they said, this is what our plan is. You you know, Cargill was a million bags, uh, Dow was a million bags of corn. And they said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna let half the people go and we're gonna expect you guys to grow the business. And I looked at them and I said, you know, I've been down this road before <laughs> when we do a merger. And I said, you're a million, we're a million. In five years, you're going to be a million bag corn company if you do this. 
And they said, oh, we don't like your philosophy and we don't like your thought, so we're not going to go forward with you. So I left them and then I went to work for Cargill Grain and uh, because I had developed some relationship with Cargill Grain, you know, the, the grain business. Right. And I ended up working out of a harbor there in Indiana and uh, basically became the sales manager for that grain business. Uh, I worked for them for another five years. And then in 2005, I was looking for another opportunity. And so I called my boss, my old boss here at Stein, Bob Hall. And I said, Bob, I need a reference. Can you give me a reference? And the next day I get a call from Myron Stein. And Myron says to me, hey, you left us 10 years ago. I said, yes, I did. <laughs> he says, dad and I would like to have you come back. And I said, well, let's sit down and talk. I, and I, he said, uh, yeah. So the next day we met, he drove over from Illinois. He was living in Illinois at the time. And so. And you had met Myron uh, oh, during yeah. your previous stint my, because he would have been in, the, in Illinois. At Myron that time. was, a, when I left the company in 95, Myron was a, a, a independent contractor yeah. with, with Stein Seed as a territory man in, in southern Illinois at that time. Yeah, so and and so I that. was aware of yep. who Myron was and, yep. and what he was capable of doing and so forth. And I said, Myron, I, I would like to sit down and talk with you. And of course, by that time, Myron was sales manager of the company. Right. Yeah, so I knew Myron. We sat down, uh, we, we talked, and we came to terms, and then I came back to Stein in 2005. And so, again, I was the regional manager for region number five. <laughs> yep. I still had Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, more so in New York, and we had a pretty good business that was started in North Carolina. And so we, we basically expanded that business in North Carolina, ended up hooking up with a distributor to down there, and really blossomed in North Carolina at that time. And so and then uh, so that's kind of where how I got started back in 2005. And I've been with the company since 2005 for my second tour. <laughs> yeah. So in that second tour since 2005, you've been a regional manager, you've been a regional sales agronomist, you've been the eastern director of sales, uh, now on to director of training. So as director of training, how do you let those, uh, your your past missions kind of inform your, your new task? Well, one of the things is with training is you hope the person who's doing the training has some experience and, and can teach from a real world perspective. Yeah. Okay. And, and when... Stein started the training division. They did a great job by putting uh, Clint Bounds in charge of training. Uh, it, it actually the first training we ever did as a company. Before, you would get a pile of brochures and, and a map, if you were lucky, <laughs> and a list of customers, and you were told to go out and sell. Yep. Okay? And you learned how to do things like turn the computers on, how to log into the portal, do all that stuff, all on your own unless your boss told you how to do it. Otherwise, it was trial by fire, okay? And and we decided, I think the company decided that it was time to maybe become a little bit more formal in our training. And so Clint Bounds actually started the training division of this company from the sales standpoint, okay? And he put together a sales program, uh, not a sales program, but an orientation program so that when we brought uh, salespeople on, that we could tell them how to write an order, how to set up an account, how to get bills paid, how to run the budget, anything like that, and how to read the Stein Statement, which has been a wonderful piece of uh, accounting. It is amazing how accurate our statement is. It's amazing how many people don't understand how the accuracy flows through that thing. Yeah. And so it takes about, oh, a couple of years just to get used to how our statement is. But once you understand it, it's pretty easy to figure out, okay? But the thing is, with... That kind of experience and, and having a good, solid base with what Clint started when he asked me to become the director of training and take his place so he could become general manager of the company, I was chewing at the bit. Clint had hired a company to do some sales training, and I fell in love with that program. In fact, I did some part-time coaching and training with that program for that company so they could reduce some of our bill that they were charging us. I think at that time they were charging us maybe $1,500 per person that we put through the sales training program. And uh, I fell in love with it to where I loved to go in and fill in for sections or here and there. Yeah. And I told Myron and, and Clint, hey, when you're ready to give up that sales training job or the training job, I'm ready to step <laughs> in, okay? Well, the opportunity presented itself after I was the uh, division 
sales director for three years. Clint needed to move up, and Myron wanted Clint to become the general manager, and so that opportunity arose a lot faster than I thought it was going to. <laughs> In fact, they sat down with me at the Stein Barn. Uh, we were having a regional sales managers meeting, and I think we had 10 regional managers at that time, and they said, we want you to take over the the training role. And I said, well, great, I'm glad. Uh, I said, uh, how much time do I have to make the decision? Well, we've already talked to somebody to take your place as the <laughs> as the uh, director of sales. and uh, So we're hoping we're, this goes the so, way we're thinking. So as soon as we're done here, we're going to go downstairs and announce <laughs> that you're the director of training. I said, well, then I guess the decision has been made. Um, and, and so that's how that happened. And, that, you know, with a company that's small, we can react quickly and, and do things yep. like that. And, and it's, since it's something I really wanted to do, it didn't take me long to accept that. Okay. Well, and you've done a fantastic job of making that role your own. And I guess, you know, for our ISRs who are listening to the podcast, I'm sure they're very familiar with what you do as the uh, director of training. But for maybe others who may not be as familiar, tell us a little bit about what that role is involves? What does that role fill in the organization? Okay. Well, the director of training is, uh, my job is to make sure the salesman is equipped to be able to do his job efficiently and effectively and work in harmony with the company, okay, especially with our sales support people. So the very first training we try to put our salespeople through is called New ISR Orientation. So we sit down with them. It's a 24-hour class. We teach them four hours on the afternoon on one day and four hours in the morning the next day. And, you know, they come out to the farm. They get to meet Harry if Harry's in the office. They get to go to the office and meet all the people there that will work with them in the future. And that's part of the orientation. And then we sit down with them at the Stein Barn, and we run them through how to how to put an order in, how to set up an account, how to read the statements, how to do all that. We talk about all the different programs that they're going to be dealing with throughout the year. So that's the first training we put them through. Then we also offer part of my job is to develop and, and implement a sales training program. And uh, I use a lot of my experience that I've had when I first started out in sales and then also other sales training programs that I've gone through. I'll take a piece here and a piece there and we built a custom sales training program for Stein. Now, I believe when you do sales training, you just can't sit down and and teach for eight hours straight and expect people to go out and sell. So what I do is I created a three-month program where I'll go in and I'll teach a half a day, and then I tell them to go out and use this for the next month and see how it works. And then I'll teach something else the next day, and we just build upon the sales process over the next three months. And when we do that training, I want to do that in their territory. I don't want them to have to come to Adele. And so usually in the winter and once in the summer, I travel to 10 or 12 different places throughout the country putting on this sales training. We usually have five or six, maybe eight people in a class. As we're adding more salespeople, those classes get bigger and they get more frequent. And so I might leave on a Sunday and not get home till Saturday and maybe have time taught four different locations at that <laughs> time. And I enjoy that, okay? I enjoy being on the road for the company. I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy seeing where they work. Today, I travel to the East Coast. I go to North Dakota. I go to Louisiana. I go to Texas, Florida, North Carolina. It's all over. Everything basically east of the Rockies we cover. And I just heard the other day that we're ready to break open California. And so that's another area that I'm looking forward to, to go and <laughs> visit, not live, but to visit. And uh, we've just opened also a distributorship type thing in Canada. And I love to go up into Canada and help those guys out as well and offer sales training to them as well. You can go up to Canada in the, in the summer and you go to California in the winter. Oh, yeah. It's, it's it works out. Florida. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I usually stage my training based on where it's warmest <laughs> in the wintertime. So, uh, yeah. So you do the onboarding kind of policies, procedures, programs, you do sales training. And then one of the other aspects I think is important is, you know, what I'd call continuing education, ongoing training, you know, whether it's through periodic training or you do these uh, boot camps, you know, and I think that's a great way 
to keep everybody everything top of mind for our sales team. So you once you get done training with that initial training, it's not like well you know good luck and Godspeed. I mean, right? There's a lot of other things that you do to to add to their uh, uh, elements. There. So a couple of things that I do uh, on a continuous basis is, and we're just getting ready to start this again next week. Is I have what is called ISR boot camp. Okay. And the boot camp is where we sit down every Thursday morning for maybe a half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour, and we train on the pertinent programs and processes that is happening. So right now, we're right in the middle of ordering. So I just did a, a impromptu boot camp uh, today on warehouse orders. And, you know, one of the other responsibilities I have is I get to do special projects every now for, for Myron and, and the team. And uh, one of the responsibilities I have is to be in charge of the warehouse program that we have, the early ship program. And so today, we we just started ordering, and, and I wanted to tell everybody how we're going to proceed with that, how we're going to... F- take situations that are over-ordered and those kind of things and fix them. You know, we're going to close the portal again here in uh, Monday, and then we're going to have to sit down and look at what we have on order and, and maybe move some stuff around from conditioner to conditioner. And so those are the things I get to do. But I try to do a boot camp every week. And I try to do a small little newsletter. We call it Sales Tips of the Week. And I try to find as much humor as I can in the situation, the selling situation out there. And and so we we try to make them fun, uh, short and sweet, and and down the road we go. So I have a great editor that helps me with that. Ann Clinton is a a godsend to this company. (laughs) Not that you couldn't have done it, David, but she's she's even better than you when it comes to editing my stuff. Um, And so uh, she does a really great job for us as well. So, you know, you talked about having walked that mile and I think that's important when it comes to training is to have buy-in. It helps for people to know that you've walked that mile, right? And uh, in your time, in your career in the seed business has spanned a very interesting point in time. As you mentioned earlier, kind of rise of biotechnology, consolidation in the industry and all these different things. So I'm curious as you think about, you know, uh, as you're meeting people who are coming into the seed business and you have this experience in the seed business, what are the, some of the things you've seen uh, over your time that you just are the big pivotal things that have happened in the seed industry in your observation? Well, believe it or not, I'm old enough to understand what three-way and four-way hybrids were, okay? <laughs> and back when we sold seed in a, a bushel bag, okay? okay? And that was kind of unique it lasted maybe a couple more years and then true single crosses kicked over, okay? And we saw th- things changing dynamically then. And, and But again, it's like what the, the process of happening with Cargill. Cargill got out of the sea business because they didn't think that they could embrace biotechnology. Biotechnology has made a, the biggest change in agriculture for the world of agriculture. Biotechnology brought a lot of good things to the agricultural industry that if we didn't have them, we'd still be polluting our ground with poisons and things like that. And and so, yeah, there's a lot of discussion about biotechnology and maybe some of the things that uh, aren't kosher or something that's happening. You know, they call it frankenseed and that kind of stuff. But biotechnology has been the number one thing that has changed the seed industry and agriculture in itself. Today, a farmer can plant a crop and not, especially a corn crop, and not necessarily have to spray an insecticide on it because of biotechnology, okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the quality of what people are eating is better because of what biotechnology has brought to the marketplace, okay? And so as I look at biotechnology and and I look at Stein Seed Company being part of that, because Stein Seed Company has their own biotech labs, and that's, that's a huge asset for this company and for us to be able to do what we do you know, Harry is the world's largest breeder of soybean seed, and, and he's one of the top five breeders when it comes to corn. And everything that we do starts with the base, the genetic base. Mm-hmm. And we start with conventionals, but then we, we design way 
ways to insert the biotechnology on a very cost-effective, very efficient basis, okay? And, and the fact that Harry Stein and his company has been able to put together a biotech firm that is almost second to none out there and, and found ways to multiply uh, generational uh, expressions and, and creating more than what just one generation a year with our Guyana project, okay, that we can get, actually get four generations a year out of that project down there. Be able to speed stuff up that way has been so exciting. And I think even today you see a lot of the different seed entities out there spending a majority of their research dollars into biotechnology. And I think that's been very key. And I am proud to be associated with this company that has its own base of biotechnology and then has a genetic base that is so desirable that when somebody else develops a new trait, they come to us and say, can you put this into your genetics? <laughs> okay. And so I think that's okay. even, even more key. But here's the key. We do such a better job of picking those genetics than anybody else that we have data that proves the stuff we sell is on the average 2.2 bushel better than what any other company sells. We do an extremely, extremely good job in picking what we want to bring to the marketplace. Yeah, we a lot of times talk about just being the ultimate product product driven company. And for a salesperson, you know, marketing is great, but if you had your choice, you'd rather have you know, the best possible product, and that's a good place to start from. So as you look at new uh, new sales representatives coming in that are, again, maybe, you know, new to the industry, more potentially new to agriculture, I know one thing I've seen you talk a lot about is the Stein story, right? Mm -hmm. And how to, how to build their Stein story. I guess I'm curious, what do you do to help equip a sales rep who's maybe just starting out? And, and I think one of the challenges they run into is, yeah, how do I differentiate, right? What, what is our differential within Stein? How do I come out and, and show we're different and, and what's different about what we have to offer? Well, I think, I think it's key. Everybody is going to have a Stein story. My Stein story is different than your Stein story because obviously I've served two terms. You're only on your first term, okay? Uh -huh. The other thing is uh, I've had personal experience in association to this company, different than anybody else has had, and, and how the company's reacted to those situations is part of my story, Okay. When a customer wants to know about Stein or a prospect wants to know about Stein, the first thing they're going to ask you is, well, who are you, Mr. Salesman? And who is Stein? I've never heard of Stein before. And of course, that be that's becoming less and less. But the thing is, we have to develop them with a certain set of data and a certain set of facts about who Harry is, who the company is, who what our breeding programs are, and so forth. And we can give those to them uh, and say, okay, these are the core things that you want to talk about, okay? And we try to emphasize on that. The other thing is you have to be able to talk about yourself. What experiences do you have? What, what expertise do you have? You know, you have a young kid who maybe grew up on the farm, and by the way, that's worth a lot. To a, to a farmer out there, if you've had the, the experience of growing up on the farm and having to do chores or having to do the, drive the tractor or plant the corn or, or harvest or whatever, that, that's worth a lot as well. But you can even take a guy who has a music degree <laughs> and teach him that kind of stuff, okay? Or, right. or uh, if he spends seven years in production ag raising seed corn, that gives him a lot more hands-on experience of, of production agriculture, okay? But those are the kind of things that you have to play upon and, and, and talk about when you're talking to a prospect about Stein Seed Company. So it all kind of rolls together. So when we talk about building your Stein story, we want, to, we want you to build a story about yourself, and then we also want you to build a story about who the company is and what they represent in the general public and then also what they represent to you. Why did you change jobs, Mr. Salesman, and come to work for Stein? What, what attracted you about Stein? Something that's going to attract you to come to work for me is going to attract somebody to want to buy from you. Okay, and so those are the things we use to help the salesman build their Stein story. It takes time, but we'll give you certain basic facts, <laughs> and then you uh, will expound upon that as you get more and more experience with us. So I guess I'm curious, you know, over the last, when did, when did you start as director About of training? About five years ago. So, so five years now, you, you've trained countless number of our sales reps, and I guess I'm curious, are there things that stand out as uh particular, you know, successes, things that you've had to adapt, or uh, what, what are things that stand out to you during your tenure as, as our lead trainer? Well, especially when we 
do our orientation training per se, I can probably look across the room and tell you who's going to be here in a year or not, okay? And I don't want to blackball anybody or anything like that, but that person, if I really like their personality and I think they have potential, I might go to them and say, look, you've got to change this or you got to work on this, and some of those things have to happen. I have a couple of different particular examples. I had a young man who went through my sales training, and everything I proposed, he back, he just didn't want to do it. And after about six months, he calls me up and says, can you run me through the sales training again? I said, well, yeah, I can. I said, what's going on? He said, well, I'm trying to do it my way and it doesn't work. And I Mm. said, well, let's try it my way, okay, or the way we teach you to do it, all right? And I said, you know, it's not about going onto the farm and dumping all the information you possibly can (laughs) at the very first call, okay? Your first call should be no more than five or six minutes. Your first call is, is to try to get an appointment, because you got to find out who you're dealing with and what they know and what they need before you can even recommend a product. And so I said, you need to take that philosophy and, and work with it. And, and that individual today, he's been with us maybe, oh, four, four years, and he's grown his business to where he's selling 2,500 bags of corn and 105,000 bags of beans. And I, I kind of count him as one of my successes, okay? Uh, because before, he wasn't selling squat, all right? That first year, he, he almost gave it up. Mm. And, and now he's making a really good living for himself and his family, okay? Another individual, and I, I'm not going to mention any names, but they know who they are. I kind of mentored this one. And uh, I just kind of took him under my wing and I said, you, these are some of the things you need to do. You need to, and I've had to have conversations with him where I talk him off the ledge, you know, because <laughs> he's, he's doing this or he's doing that. He's, we just got to get him off the ledge. And he calls me for advice just because of the relationship that we have. And I say, well, you need to do this or you need to do this. And we finally talked to this individual to hire a, a helper, okay? And then he found out, well, if I hire somebody to do my books, then that gives me more time to go out and sell. And then he decided that he didn't need to become a truck driver. And so he didn't need to have a trailer and his pickup truck and go out and deliver seed to his customers because he could hire somebody to do that. And again, that freed up his time to go out and sell. There comes a time when you're teaching or when you're coaching and all of a sudden you see the light bulb come on. And they go, ah, I need to do that. And if that happens, that's that's the biggest reward I could ask for out there. Well, you've been an electric company of sorts then for us over the last five years. So, no, that, that, that's awesome. So, as we close up here, Ken, I was going to say, you know, uh, anybody who knows you knows that you're always uh, one for a good joke. You're, you're larger than life. Uh, you're a gregarious character. And so I figured I can't have you on the podcast without seeing if you've got, got something in the holster here for us. You got a, you got a joke for us to close out our, our uh, podcast today. I do. And, and you know, I, 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 um, you, you asked me yesterday to, to think about that. And so I'm sitting there going, why am I the way that I am? Okay. We all ask that, by the yeah, way. Yeah, by the way, I, I, would, I would not doubt that. And so I thought back about growing up as a young child, and my father used to tell us stories, and, and he told one joke. And, and today, I'm, you know, 60 years later, I still don't understand this joke. <laughs> Okay, and, and and it's really quite simple. Uh, but I have another story for you after this. But okay. okay, my father would say, Ken, I want you to think about this. There are four ducks sitting on a log, and three would fly away, and one victrolled. And I'm looking at him, going, One what? He said victrolled. And I go, What does that mean? And he would just laugh. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, What does that mean, Dad? He goes. They, it Victrolid. I said, well, Victrola is the, the, the record player you play with, you know, with a crank. He goes, absolutely. And then he would just walk away. And, and I'm sitting there going, Dad, what's going on? And so I took it upon myself as I grew up. I'm never going to tell a joke like that because I want my jokes to have a purpose. All right? So... So let me share you with this story that I have. As I get older, uh, you know, I've been in this business for over 40 years, and I've met some really good people. And I have a couple of friends who are married, and they're in their 90s. And one of the problems they have is they can't communicate with each other anymore because they forget stuff. 
okay? And so I was talking to him one day and I said, why don't you go to a doctor and see if they can't do something to help you? So the doctor sat down with him and said, what I think you need to do is when you're talking, you need to write stuff down on a piece of paper. That way, you know what the other person is asking and then you can, over time, address that. And they said, well, that's a wonderful idea. And their name was Maud and Harold, okay? And so they go home that night, and they're sitting in front of the TV, and Maud says, Harold, I'm going to get me a bowl of ice cream. Would you like a bowl of ice cream? And Harold says, well, I would love a bowl of ice cream. So Maud gets up, and he says, well, aren't you going to write that down like the doctor? Harold, it's ice cream. I can remember from here to the kitchen, a bowl of ice cream. And he says, by the way, I would like to have some strawberry syrup on it too. She says, okay, you want a bowl of ice cream with strawberry syrup? He goes, yes, that's what I want. Aren't you gonna write that down? She says, no, I don't need to write that down. And so about 10 minutes later, she comes out and hands him a plate with scrambled eggs and bacon on it. And she says, here's what you wanted. And he looked at the plate and says, I asked for eggs sunny side up, and you didn't bring me my toast either. <laughs> and so uh, one thing I have learned at this company is that you probably should write stuff down, okay? <laughs> for, for various reasons. And, and as I get older, I find that I need to write stuff down. And so my word of advice to you is before you forget and bring the wrong thing to your customer, write down what they want, all right? And, Thanks. And, and communication is key. <laughs> and communication is key, that's right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that didn't disappoint. I, I, I'm glad you, glad you had one for us today. Appreciate the story. <laughs> Anyway, Ken, thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast today. You've got a great wealth of experience. You serve a vital function in this organization and uh, definitely enjoyed hearing more about what that role is and your past history. Um, so thanks for being on the show. David, I've enjoyed it. Somewhere we'll find another time to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's our time for today. I'd like to thank our guests and our listeners for joining us for another episode of the Stein Seedcast. We'll be back again soon with more expert interviews and insights about all things Stein. And to never miss an episode, subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Stein has yield. <laughs>